Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live, and download our free app to your smartphone and stream all of our live local shows, including the Jim Parisi Show and the Jake Feinberg Show. And we thank you so much for making us part of your day today. Without further ado, I want to bring in one of the founding members of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, a guy who's continually keeping time an arithmetist, one of the original members, and a guy who still is doing it today, Bruce Conkle. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, thanks, Jake. Thanks for having me. You know, I wanted to ask you about, um, especially when you were woodshedding uh, when you were younger, uh, before the the dirt band really got going. You know, I've I've talked to a, a number of of cats from your generation of musicians, uh, and I wanted you to talk about some of the cats that you had a chance to back up um, and really learn and get humbled and maybe even get kicked off the bandstand. <laughs> Interesting. Well, before the dirt band, I was in high school with Jeff Hanna, and we um, we just kind of started out and um, followed our instincts and uh, our friends at McCabe's Guitar Shop and got into lots and lots of uh, old-timey and country music and Americana in general. And we uh, we just kind of came out of shoot number two and and made it, you know. So we didn't, I didn't have any extensive experience backing anybody or playing with anybody at that time. But um, we were just high school kids, and uh, we had a, a formula that uh, appealed to a lot of people. And um, we were off and running, you know. When I was eighteen years old, we had our first hit, "Life for Me in the Rain." Can you, so. can you for for people li- listening all over the world uh, on Power Talk? Uh, you know, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band has sold millions of records. Uh, yep. You know, um, but how did you get to the to this formula? How much trial and error? Can you talk specifically about how you developed this formula and and where you did it? Because I guess my point is that you know, at thirty eight years old. And for younger generations, too, there's just a lot of cats that are looking to put a concoction together and a formula and do some chemistry and throw this into a pot, but they don't have any time to do it. Um, there are no venues to get comfortable on the bandstand anymore. So, yeah, it's a bit of a problem in a commodified world. You know, it's uh, kind of uh, the, the industry creates a false scarcity when there's, in fact, really an abundance. There's no shortage of uh, genius. There's a huge shortage of venue but uh what we did is real simple stupid um uh stupid simple marketing i mean we just we were playing a a uh a place in orange county called the paradox and we just kind of asked every girl we knew to ask every girl they knew to come on down <laughs> to and, and make a line around the block and then call the newspapers and uh you know we created our own sensation kind of thing but um I'm talking yeah, more. I'm not even good. talking about how you created a scene. I'm talking more about the sound. Your how did you develop your sound? Well, initially we were a jug band, you know, influenced by Jim Question and those kind of folks, and um, we uh, we were just unique and funny, and uh, people liked us. Uh, I don't know. Um, it was just an appealing kind of a genre at the time. Talking and to of Bruce. Course, yeah. No. I yeah. mean. I guess more specifically, I mean, you know, uh, Queskin had, I've interviewed all the cats in that band, uh, including the late, the late great Bill Keith. But the the thing is, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, was it something that, um, so it included sort of um, almost um, stand up routines where there was a, a back and forth dialogue as well. It wasn't just strictly instrumental. Well, that's true. We we put on a show, and we were very entertaining. We had a lot of fun. The music was great. The entertainment was fantastic. Uh, there was a great synergy on stage with the original six of us, and um, people just loved it. And we uh, wore ourselves out uh, playing around the clock to establish uh, establish um, identity with the with the with the logo Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Um, one of the reasons why I left the business. Um, it's just, you know, <laughs> just way too much, uh, craziness. Did, uh, can you talk about, um, part of my show deals uh, in the metaphysical and, uh, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about when you guys were 
having this synergistic effect on stage and then interacting with the audience. If you could talk about um, being on the bandstand, uh, maybe it was after a long tour, uh, you were really physically exhausted, um, and where you actually left your physical body. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Um, but, you know, fatigue is what it is. You know, um, we were on a lot of tours. We were on a couple, opened up for the doors a few times, you know, in 67, did a lot of TV work um, and movies. And uh, it was just really drinking from a fire hose, going around promoting the the name of the band. And um, and the fatigue was, was real and palpable. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I just decided that that lifestyle wasn't for me. It made me very interested in social psychology and philosophy and, and um, moral economics. Um, and that's kind of how I pursued it. I still um, remain true to my art. Um, I have a group called Kunkel and Harris right now that uh, we're both singer-songwriters and write from the heart and um, are not at all really interested in commercialization. We're, uh, we're pretty much, we believe that art belongs in the community. And for everyone you see up there making it, there's 10,000 musicians that are just as worthy that won't make it by the very structure of the industry itself. So it made me, um, made me, uh, the experience I'm very grateful for, but it made me very uh, introspective and retrospective in terms of what's it all about. <laughs> um, I'm curious because introspection is key. Uh, do you believe that, that um, you know, LSD had something to do with it? LSD? Yeah, well, because a lot of, I mean, what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is this, that we are living in a time, you talked about the commodification the, of the industry, shortage of venues, even though there's no reason to it. Uh, my, my belief, after interviewing 600 cats, is that a lot of people were dosing or getting dosed, very square people, but because of that, they were able to be incredibly introspective, even if they didn't become, you know, completely moral, uh, you know, people, it still expanded their consciousness, it made them more enlightened. And now we're dealing in a situation where, you know, people have talked about microdosing or, you know, these, uh, these different forms of, of LSD, but I'm a big proponent of bringing it back because I just feel like we're living in an incredibly conformist time. Uh, yeah, well, I, uh, no, I, I, I totally agree with you there. Uh, there's many paths to doing that. I, I did some, you know, experimentation back in those days with it. I've also, um, you know, been absolutely clean and sober for the last 27 years, uh, not doing anything, and doing quite a bit of meditating and, and other types of uh, practices that get one to the same spot. But um, I totally am uh, interested in the, the uh, therapeutic effects and the and the the spiritual enhancing effects of, uh, of psychotropic drugs and, and LSD and, and whatnot. Um, and can, can I you talk about a seminal, can you talk about a seminal, because what I'm saying is I don't really know if Densmore or yourself or, I mean, you're older now, no, you're not dropping acid now, but what, but can you talk about a seminal experience on psychotropic drugs that got you to a point where now you are meditating and reaching that same peak. Well, I don't know if there's a direct correlation other than the fact that we're all trying to escape the madness of um, a straight-jacketed world, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I, go ahead. All of, are, all, all of us are looking for uh, a path for meaning. I mean, um, when everything is commodified, when everything... I mean, it's not natural law the way we're living. It just ain't natural law, nor is our economics. It's all constructed, and it's not constructed in the service of all generations of all species, which it certainly could be if we had a little different um, uh, uh, focus on how we want to do things. We're extremely clever species technologically, but I think we're a bunch of moral cretins in terms of how we use that. Um, when you say we, who are you referring to? I'm talking about the human, the human animal. Let me put it that way. In our current state, absolutely. I mean, Gary Bartz, the great tenor, he said, you know, with the amount of war and carnage, we are not evolved human beings. We are still human animals. But and that's that's a, a great deal of that has to do with the structure of our economics and who has the um, who um, 
who makes money off of this stuff, you know? Right. <laughs> it's inveterate interest. It's not natural law, yet we walk around as if it is. Did too you... few people are thinking. Yes. Uh, too, too few people are acting. And too few people are sitting on the cushion long enough. Um, yep. Can you talk about, um, uh, going back, I mean, you know, Lester Chambers was on the, was, was a beatnik, and uh, these cats were, you know, playing... Uh, you know, uh, you know, brush bars on cars up for drums, and everybody was was eating Owsley's acid. And I just want to, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a big part of my show, and I and I because yeah, I, yeah. you know, and I and I and I just because here's my point is that I I I can tell you are an incredibly articulate individual. You're obviously pretty bright, um, and so I read a lot. That's good. You said, I mean, no, Questkin does too. I mean, those cat, you know, you, you, you there are still these cats out there, but. When did you, do you believe that your introspection and your seeking for, you know, sort of a moral, I don't, a moral economy, just a moral, moral approach to life occurred in, at the begin the beginnings of it occurred when you started doing LSD? Uh, I'd say that was a catalyst along the way. I think the crucible of my becoming, you know, as a, uh, you know, growing up in that, in the church and, and being the bad boy in Sunday school and asking the deep penetrating questions beyond <laughs> the, uh, the, um, the, the, the mythical, which I always had a problem with getting into the concrete of how do we, uh, how do we evolve morally? Because we're certainly stunted right now. And that's kind of been a life theme for me throughout my, um, throughout my life. Yeah, and certainly psychedelics in the time of my becoming was a moral crucible. I mean, you had the war in Vietnam, you had the civil rights movement. I was active in both of those things. The, um, the authoritarian structures that we'd all been living under were laid bare as, uh, you know, being empty sets. So, yeah, uh, we were all experimenting with lots of things to try to find some meaning. Um, yeah, I think LSD cracked open a, a lot of that for a lot of people. I don't think it's an end in itself, though. Um. So, uh, you believe at this as far as natural law? Could you op- unpack what you mean by that? And then, do you believe that it was operating natural law was operating at a more rational way uh, at a different point in our society? No, I don't think. We're <laughs> okay, so we want, because I mean this is really important because I, I mean I yeah I, yeah yeah, yeah. Let, let me answer that. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I don't want to get retro romantic. I think we're always evolving and we're uh, evolving towards something. Um, not to be teleological or anything, but um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, you know, nothing sits still. And um, we're, we're, in my view, uh, we could we could we could be doing so much more uh, for um, the promotion of authentic joy, well-being for all generations, of all species. Right now, we're stuck in a consumerist bunch of crap, and. Uh, um, we play out our roles within that. Um, and you need to break out of that. Uh, LSD, whatever. I, I mean, it wasn't a big part of my life. It was a, a part of my life back then. But, um, you know, most of my growth, and uh, it's, it's a continuing kind of a deal um, throughout life, all experiences. Um, I guess what I'm trying to going back to that, I mean, uh what specifically could we be doing differently? I mean, I have two daughters. I, I worry about them. Oh, I don't know. Let's see. How about harvesting your own electricity, driving an electric car, getting rid of uh, meters? I mean, we're at a, we're at a time uh, where we can actually decentralize from uh, those that own the meters. Um, grow your own food. You know, start neighborhood co-ops. Uh, lots and lots of ways. Uh, those things are act. those things are happening, but they are they are uh, vilified amongst the berserko capitalist structure, right? I mean, I, I see that stuff happening in Tucson all the time. Well, yeah, oh, of course, and uh, and I think unplugging from from that as your primary information source, and um, taking advantage of the fact that you live in a time where you can access all information from all time, um, anyone in the in the world. So it becomes more important what questions are you asking. And how are you framing things? Because if you listen to mainstream media all the time, things will be framed for you, and you are essentially in a cognitive prison about how you go about looking at things. 
So I think it's really important for us all to break out of that and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. <laughs> Dissonance is your friend. And, and let's and let's tie it back in. I mean, obviously the Dirt Band had major success, but can you talk about uh, being uh, being uncomfortable on the bandstand uh, and uh, fighting it, fighting it, and how you overcame it, how it made you a stronger player and a, and a bigger person? Well, I don't think I was ever uncomfortable on the bandstand. I love to perform. Don't get me wrong. Um, that was that's that's delicious. You know, performing. That's that's what you live for as a as a performing artist. Um, that wasn't it at all. It was, um, it was this fitting into a structure in which middlemen, you know, essentially took everything from the artist and, and determined how you were presented, especially at that time. I mean, um, since technology now is in the hands of, you know, and really cheap, same stuff that used to cost millions of dollars, it's, um, allowed artists all over the place to flourish and control their own art a lot more than they used to. But still... Um, in order to get recognized, you have to go out and play this commercial game on a mass thing, uh, which I believe is just, you know, a dead end. And it certainly is robbing everybody within whatever community to uh, recognize the genius that's all around them all the time. It's uh, there. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I, I mean, uh, but I, I mean... Can you? Did you? Have you seen all the royalties and that you that you've earned from? Oh Christ, no. Okay, so no. and but I mean, even back to when you guys were in high school and and woodshedding on the bandstand and trying to develop your own original sound. Uh, can you talk about um, you know the the uh, the unscrupulous nature of of the business and what how it affected you? Well, it, it affected me and it ultimately made uh, allowed me to to think that I didn't want that as a lifestyle. But, um, you know, as a baby, I didn't know anything. I just, uh, none of us did. Uh, nobody comes with an instruction book on how, <laughs> how to negotiate this madness. So, um, yeah, it's just living through it and kind of sticking my, for myself, sticking to um, my principles. Can we break down? I mean, can, we, can we break down Bruce Kunkel's principles on the Jake Feinberg show? I mean, this is this is what, what, sure. what, what my show is about. Uh, love it all madly, man. <laughs> uh, love it all madly. You know, just be kind to people. Do your do your best. Be introspective. Question everything, and um, I don't know. Do the best you can with what you got. It ain't what you got. It's what you do with what you got. You know. I'm always curious about uh, when I talk to a lot of cats about the, you know, on the bandstand, we are a very verbal society now. Uh, a ton of people uh, sort of hinge on uh, words. They get very offended. Uh, people, I know Cal Jader's band back in the day. Uh, Cal was, a, was an alcoholic. Dick Burke, his drummer, was a 350 pounds. John Hurd, his bass player, was, had a stuttering problem. Mike mm -hmm. Wolf, Mike Wolf had Tourette syndrome. Uh, you know, and yet they had Mongo Santa Maria and Willy Bobo on congas and, and, uh, you know, they were getting, you know, just hatred and less pay. And, and the point is that they were all able to make fun of each other and poke fun at each other and not take it that seriously. Where now we are in a hypersensitive time. Everybody's leaning on all these words. Oh, wow. So hmm. what, what I'm getting at is if you could talk about, uh, nonverbal communication on the bandstand and, you know, uh, some of the cats, or, or give an example of how the, the, the dirt band worked when you didn't have to express yourself verbally in order to communicate what you wanted. Well, that's, that's, that's the magic of performing and playing together a long time and loving what you do. You know, we, there was lots and lots of cues constantly for that. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to um, magnify in on any one interaction or anything, but uh, it's just something that's synergistic in performance. Um, it happens. It's hard to uh, describe, but it's kind of kind of the magic of performing with others. Well, I, I have think, a great yeah, deal of that with my yeah. current partner. Okay, you want to talk about that with your current partner? Oh, Rob Harris and I. I mean, this is the guy that I met when I went back to college and. Um, uh, we've been playing together for 40 years now. Both of us had careers in Silicon Valley and 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 uh, families and that kind of stuff in between. Um, now we're out there playing again, and um, it's just really delicious. Uh, 
But Rob and I have always had this incredible synergy um, that is just beyond comprehension for me. I mean, we kind of like are in each other's minds. Um, I don't know how to describe it, but it's a very, very special thing, very magical thing. Um, I mean, you know, because uh, can you talk? I mean, did you can you did you play jazz gigs? I mean, uh... well, you know, a- after I left the Dirt Band, I um, formed a band called Word Salad, which was a, a jazz fusion band. And Word, um, Word Salad. Yep. Oh, that is. And... I need I need tapes of that immediately. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, that was a weird period. Who was um, in that band? Uh, me, Jimmy Gallum, uh, Chuck, uh, D- pardon me, Dave Healy, and Mark, um, God, what's his name? I, I forget his last name. But uh, I was playing between lead guitar and alto sax, playing a little bit of jazz, and uh, Jimmy Gallum was a fantastic Jimmy Smith-type organist. And um, so we did, you know, we're trying to fuse jazz and rock at that time. I mean, quite a bit different from what I was playing with the Dirt Band. Um, one night when we were playing at the Whiskey with the Allman Brothers, or Wayne and Greg Allman as the Hourglass at that time, good friends, wow. we had a jam that included Dwayne, Greg, me, Paul Butterfield, um, Janis Joplin, uh, Steve Stills, Jimmy Fadden from the Dirt Band. It was a magic night, but um, it was, uh, that's kind of... <laughs> um, I don't know. There's just a lot of magic. I've, I've done a lot of different things. I've, you know, um, really gotten into blues, blues guitar and slide guitar and all that kind of stuff since then. Played in all black clubs and all black bands. Um, only the white, the only white boy. And then, of course, academics and family. And you know, it's all good. They're all facets of life. Well, I want to get back. I want to get back delicious. to word salad here. I mean, the idea. This sure. is because I mean, you know, I mean. Can you talk? I mean, you're, you're telling me you did not have any uh, qualms uh, struggling with, you know, I mean, were you getting off on cats like Elvin Jones and Art Blakey and those guys? I mean, did you, th- that nitty gritty dirt band is the farthest thing from that, you know, as far as. It the- is, you know, um, but I, I have a, a very wide spectrum of taste and appreciate all genres of music. Um, I'm just really picky within those genres on who I like. Um, mm-hmm. when I was, uh, in junior high school, I was, uh, you know, learning alto saxophone and uh, coming home and learning uh, Paul Desmond's riffs on the Brubeck albums mm-hmm. and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I've always liked jazz, um, as well as folk and traditional folk. It all speaks to me. It's all uniquely American art, and it's delicious. You know, we're, we're rich with it here. And we're also kind of befuddled in this commercialization of all of it, too. Um, so I, I want to get your opinion on this. I, I've talked to um, uh, some people about, uh, I wanted to get your concept on when you're in the middle of a, of a jam and, uh, mm-hmm. and you lose your way and you get lost within that jam. It's not a structured song. Um, and the idea that any note can be the one. Any note can be the one. Uh, and you can always find your way back to the one. And I wanted you to talk about getting lost. Your, your, your feeling about that philosophy. Well, I don't know. If, if you're lost, sit out. It's part of the, it's part of the whole synergy. Um, I, don't, I don't know about getting lost. I don't, I don't even consider that. Um, it's just kind of feeling in and out of the pulse of what's going on. Um, I, I, I really don't know how to answer that. Talking to Bruce Kunkel here on the Jake Feinberg show. You know, um, I, I brought up the Jazzers before because cats like Miles Davis, uh, you know, Coltrane used to come up to him. Uh, I remember talking to Dave Holland, and you know, Train would come up to him and say, you know, when he first joined his band, say, "What do you want me to play? What do you want me to play?" And and Miles kept turning his back on him, and Train finally realized that uh, uh, he wanted him to be himself. That's why he hired him. Uh, yeah. And I mean. Can you talk about a seminal experience on the bandstand? Because I, that's when the nonverbal communication is key. I mean, you guys were together for, in different incarnations, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, for quite a while. And I'm just trying Well, to... actually together for 50 years. 50 they're on a years? 50... Yeah, they're on a, a tour right now, and they just played uh, the Ryman Auditorium last night. I saw them last week when they were out here in Sonoma County, and we had a great time together and reunion and whatnot. 
But the uh, the band, three of the original six, are still um, in the band. Johnny McEwen, uh, Jeff Hanna, and Jimmy Fadden. And three of us are not. But, um, uh, yeah, that band's been going forever. Um, so who, who, who would be considered... Uh, the did who was the best leader that you've worked under and why the best leader i don't know uh, <laughs> i've always kind of been that guy you yeah, know um, okay so let's get to it because you know what uh stanley clark uh he always said it to he goes you know best kept secret is he's a bass player but he goes you know the rhythm sections have always driven new vocabulary and pushed the music forward and the drummers, in many ways, are the leaders of the band, whether or not they are the traditional forefront person. So talk about it. Talk about being a leader. How, what are the qualities of leadership that you would, you know, talking to cats in Japan and in Europe, my show is extremely popular, not in the States, but what are the qualities of Bruce Kunkel leadership that are essential when you're leading a band of melodic improvisation? Well, I don't know. All I can say is that um, his vision is, is heart, soul, and... Um, communicating that with others and i don't know there is it's not a it's not something you sit down and decide rationally it's something that that happens synergistically with um the the chemistry of those that you're playing with can you give me um, a specific and, example of, of of a time when you had to exude certain leadership oh boy um Nothing's coming to mind right now. I just don't like I don't like to deal with platitudes when I'm talking to geniuses. So if you could give some kind of, you know, specificity of when you were even when you were younger, I mean, you can't argue the fact that people are insecure and, and not able to find their voice right away. So wh where was there was a, p a period where a, a, or a point where, most Yeah. Yeah, most of that kind of insecurity came when you're off stage rather than on stage. For me anyway, for mm -hmm. speaking from my own experience. When I'm on stage, it's there's something, there's another part of me that kind of takes over stuff and plays better to an audience than I can ever play for by myself. I don't know how to, you know, that's my own unique experience. Well, what about off stage? Off stage, that's when you're reflective. That's when you're hypercritical of self and others. And, and also, um, that's where you, know, you ponder what can be and try to implement that. Uh, and move towards implementing stuff. Um, so I don't know. It's like not not ever being totally satisfied with what it is, except for when you're doing it. Fascinating as uh, Bruce Kunkel continues to bob and weave here. Did you? Did you? Did you? <laughs> did, 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 I'm reading here bob that you. Did, did you? Did, do you remember the jam session you had with Dizzy Gillespie? I didn't have a jam session with. Gillespie. When did you actually leave, first leave the 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 Nitty Gritty Dirt Band? Uh, Nineteen sixty eight. We we were there from Jeff and I started the the roots of it in sixty five, and I left in sixty eight. And that's when Word Salad began. That's when Word Salad began of the people. Um, of the people. Well, now, I, now, were there any records made of these? Of these, I, I, I got. I need. I need some copies. I want to hear Conkel in a, in a jazz rock set. Uh, nothing. Nothing was uh, ever documented back then. We didn't have uh, access to our own recording gear. It was expensive, and city at the time was, you know, no, did not do that. Have nothing to show you. I did make some. Uh, <laughs> some tapes for the Allman Brothers is my studio band but I did not like the way they turned out and so those are history and off somewhere I don't know where they're so you said can you go back to that Whiskey A Go Go show you talked about Hourglass you, sure. you were close with uh, with with uh, Dwayne and Greg yeah actually when we were on a tour uh, in St. Louis uh, me and Jimmy Fadden and, and Ralph Barr walked into a a bar in Old Town, and there was this fantastic band playing called The Almond Joy, and knocked my socks off, and um, got became friends with Wayne and Greg, and invited them out to Hollywood, and they came out and stayed in our home for a while. We had a, their band had a big four-story thing that was, you know, over the edge of the hills in the Hollywood Hills, and they came out and played with us, and our manager, Bill McEwen at the time, uh, signed them to a record contract for Liberty Records, 
as the hourglass. And um, just to hang out with Dwayne a lot. He was a very good friend and got me into slide playing and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, a lot but of people, a lot of people get down on that double album, you know, that Hourglass album. They say it was just, yeah. uh, it was tough. Um, could you could you talk to the audience about your concept of love and aside from music, how you bring love to the world? Wow, beautiful. Um, how I bring love, I just wow. I try to have life practices that. Um, you know, keep me going in that direction. Sleep enough, eat enough, be with friends enough. Um, do, you know, be kind. Um, love it all madly. I, I love it all life. madly. Nate, I mean, that is the. Where did is that your line? Where did you come up with that? That is my line. That, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to take. I'm going to beg borrow that line. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, well, this, I mean, it's all it's all radiantly beautiful. <laughs> Even the stuff that ain't uh, in the in in the grand unfolding of things. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of my attitude. I try to uh, you know uh, point the finger at myself uh, when something goes wrong instead of at others. Um, that took a while to learn, but it was a good thing to learn. And um, uh, you know, I, I try to love people in everything they do. Um, being courteous to people that have menial jobs, for example. I mean, seeing people as human, humanizing the relationships with people instead of treating them as objects or another thing in a uh, in a world that's uh, pretty much lost an in instrumental valuation rather than intrinsic values of everything. This is and absolutely. I, think, you say, I mean, I think. I mean, do you have an opportunity to? Um... I don't want to say spread wisdom, but I mean, have you been involved with TED Talks? I think some of this stuff, you're, you're right on the pulse of it. I mean, have you had an opportunity to well, talk? Well, no, I, I, I read about 200 books a year. I've been doing that for a long time. Um, and I'm very familiar with a lot of TED Talks. I'm in a lot of different intellectual communities all over the world, thanks to um, social networking and, uh, you know, social media. You can find the people, uh, your, your communities, uh, of interest, no matter where you are. So, um, yeah, I um, I, I, I just drink heavily from the trough of. Uh, <laughs> it's a deep, a deep well of of information. Yeah. I mean, yeah. can you talk about? I mean, I, this is the other thing. I mean, you know, Bill Graham used to put Commander Cody, Tiny Tim, and the Count Basie Orchestra on the same bill. What was the? Well, that was, that was horrible. In fact, the last gig I had... Why was that horrible? That To me, that's stretching people's ears. Well, well okay, that's fine. That's one perspective. Right. Here's another perspective. Okay. The Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and Blue Cheer. Yeah. It's the worst bill ever. Yeah. <laughs> that, was a, that was at the Fillmore, and that was the last gig I did with the band. I said, that's enough. You don't feel that, but okay, so that was not a great match made in heaven, but you don't feel that, I mean, nowadays you go, it's it's uh, a country festival, and it's all quote-unquote country music, or you go to a jazz festival, a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but everything's put into, how have genres, the, the labeling, how has that stifled, in, if it has, the vocabulary of music? Well, I think when you have a situation like, I'm getting back to the the fact that it's a commodified bunch of art, you have bean counters in control of what gets presented rather than artists. And such, uh, and when a bean counter is in control, they'll take a trend that sold before and try to shape what the artist is doing into that. So you have a, a system in place that kind of creates trends, quote unquote, uh, and genres rather than, um, in my view, having a system that creates uh, cascading renaissance, um, <laughs> uh, which I believe is possible should we be able to enable all those that aren't heard to be heard. I mean, but right now it fits into commercial trends and commercial, commercial uh, categories, and they're all defined that way. And I think it could yeah. be much broader. I think we get, we're on the cusp of an explosion of, of um, different forms. I was just going to ask you about to put your profit hat on for a minute and talk about um, 
projecting down the road, I mean, you have, uh, you know, this sort of um, uh, basket of deplorables that I believe they think Armageddon is coming and they don't care if we go over, <laughs> over the cliff. So do you feel that uh, uh, what is your prediction or what do you see? Uh, do Are we going to come out of the abyss? Is there a point in your reading can you talk to well, the audience about any any uh, book that you've read that can point to this? Does history, are we living through unprecedented times, or is oh God, this yeah. okay? So so, but but just paint the picture of where you see things coming because obviously, I mean you you've seen my show, you you know where I'm going with you know with my posts. I've tried to be as creative as possible right. and self starting sure. as possible, but it's a little disjointed. So where are we headed? Well. I'm a radical agnostic. As much as I read and stuff, I, I have I try to keep myself free of belief. Mm -hmm. I have one hell of a an eclectic and dynamic working hypothesis that I get my stasis from. But I try to hold three truths um, at all times. It's getting worse, which is true. It's getting better, which is true. And the and from a very high altitude, it's uh, it's absolutely perfect just the way it is. Um, I mean. All those things are happening. Who knows how it's going to turn out? But, I mean, there's some very, very big problems that the human animal has created for himself and other species on this planet. There's also the technological brilliance and the handover to um, uh, a time where we have an ever-accelerating increasing intelligence in AI and robotics. So we're very much on the cusp of saying, what the hell is an economy all about? What are we doing? I mean, there's some very, very big changes that are uh, upon us um, and and accelerating upon us uh, to the point where we can't even recognize them until they get here. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. I just try to do the best I can in the life I lead, and um, you know, I'm very involved in, in local uh, politics, local, uh, uh, local economic localization, that kind of stuff in my own personal life and um, playing music and having discussions, starting salons. No, I dig. I mean, this is just part one of uh, probably going to have to do about nine parts with uh, the originator of word salad, Bruce Kunkel. Um, did you, did you, um, can you, can you talk about, uh, give me a good Bernie Ledden story? Actually, no, <laughs> other than he, he, um, he just, you know, we we're all kind of hanging out at the same time. And he ended up with the Eagles, and uh, him and Dwayne and I were, you know, peripherally hanging out together from time to time. But um, he he went off with the Eagles and then eventually joined the Dirt Band for a short period of time. Um, but I'm not real close to him. No, was, uh, that was just popped in my head because when I, I interviewed David Crosby in March, he was talking when he played on the Sunset Strip. Uh, and uh, with the birds, they play all night. And I uh, uh, believe it was Kerouac and his partner would come and dance all night. And I wanted to know about the impact of the of the beat poets on Bruce Kunkel, not just their uh, writings, but if you had any interaction with them. Uh, actually, not a lot. But other than having exposure to them and their ideas, and having tremendous respect for um, the courage to buck up against you know, the norm, and to, to create new pathways into art and understanding. Um, but I, no, I, I, I had no sit-downs with those folks. My, um, my, my, uh, my, my bandmates, uh, you know, was Jackson Brown and uh, Jeff Hanna and Jimmy Fadden. We were, we were um, you know, that was our first home away from home. And, uh, we were all influenced by that stuff coming out of that crucible, but um, no direct, uh, you know, face to face with any of those. What, what was your home away from home? Oh, I'm talking about our first time uh, moving out of our parents' home, in as the nitty gritty dirt man. Right. Um, you know, I mean, we were kids. Would you say that that so you guys were reading those texts though when you were. In, in the nitty gritty dirt band. So it, it, the idea of a communal living off the grid, uh, leading your own way. Um, those... Well, not, not so much then. I mean, uh, over time, you know, there's been many influences throughout a life. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not a young man anymore, but um, 
all, all, the, all the way through a life, uh, you know, you have exposures, opportunities, and mentorships. And I think that's kind of what um, differentiates us from pretty much being the same bundle of potentials as, uh, as individuals. Final question for you, Bruce. Can you talk sure. about the most inspiring thing that's happened to you or that you've witnessed in 2016? Wow. Most inspiring thing. Well, I don't know what's inspiring, but I sure had a good time meeting up with my old bandmates a week ago uh, when they came to Sonoma. And we just had a great time. And it was like um, back in high school again. Um, but in terms of... Uh, what made it, can you, I mean, without, maybe it's self-explanatory to you, but can you, I mean, can you talk about what made it special? Well, Jeff Hanna and I were very best friends all through high school and, and through that early dirt band period, and um, our paths have gone in different directions, and uh, coming back together was just really a blast. It was just fun. It's like there had been no time past, if you know what I mean. So we just had a great time. That's all I can say. Well, all I can say is that, you know, we cooked through 42 minutes here, and uh, I hope we can pick it up and do uh, and do a part two down the, down the road. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. All right, buddy. Talk to you soon. Take care. Later. Bye-bye. Just heard from the original drummer of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, Bruce Kunkel. Uh, we are uh, awaiting a, a guest of mine, uh, Shin Shin uh, Bar. Alcazar, and uh, when he arrives, we will pick up our conversation. Until then, we'll rejoin the Jim Perry.